hear from IBM. And specifically in IBM, we're going to hear a presentation called Enabling Quantum Computing Over the Cloud. And we've got Jerry Chow, who's the manager of experimental quantum computing at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center based in New York, who has just come in from uh, Southwest Southwest in Austin, Texas, to be with us today. And he's going to be talking about this whole changing game space of quantum computing. And you're going to hear also that there's a chance for you to partner and become part of this initiative through this collaborative uh, computing, collaborative sharing of mindsets. So I would like to ask, here he is. Please come and join us on stage. Jerry, thank you. Welcome. It's all yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for being here this morning. And really excited to be at this conference to tell you a little bit about quantum computing and uh, where, it's, where it fits in the full ecosystem of, of uh, high performance computing moving, moving forward. Um, what's actually interesting, I think, is to take a step back and remember that computers used to look like this. In the 1940s, this is actually Colossus, right? This is a computer which. Uh, at the time was really important for the, the World War uh, and involved actually flipping mechanical switches, using things like punch cards, and took up an entire room to do very basic rudimentary calculations. And then now today in our watches and our phones we have computer processors that far outpace anything that was in this type of system. And it's interesting to look at the progression of technology in digital computing over the past three quarters of a century, right? It's just been phenomenal where we've gotten to uh, in terms of computing capability and physical implementation of digital computing. Going from those very mechanical switches, vacuum tubes, eventually to the transistors that have become integrated into all of our circuits and processors today. And we all know this as the picture of Bohr's Law, the progression of these different, uh, these different paradigms of physical implementation. And we know that Moore's law is coming to an end. And the question now becomes, is this really the limit of compu computation? Have we reached uh, the end? Of course, we certainly don't want that to be the case. We want there to be more that we can continue to work on and to continue to use and leverage to solve problems. And here's the thing, even with all the progression that we've seen with digital computers along that Moore's Law path, there's still some fundamentally different problems out there, difficult problems that cannot be addressed, right? So we know that there are certain problems out there that are easily addressed on traditional computers, things like word processing or uh, multiplying numbers, things that are polynomial in the types of solution space. But then there already exists a class of problems that are just too difficult to ever handle. And that's because they grow exponentially in nature. Problems in the space of chemistry, where you have all these interacting electrons and trying to understand a larger and larger molecule and how it works becomes very, very difficult. There's just too many different interactions to keep track of. Other logistics problems that we might have heard of, things like traveling salesmen, things like the knapsack problem. And then, of course, there's machine learning. Everyone's talking about machine learning today. And we all know that as you have machine learning with, with uh, expanding nets and having larger feature spaces with many embeddings, the, the, the total feature space can grow really, really fast, really, really quickly. And so it's really in this type of picture that we see easy problems and hard problems and know that there's a fundamental limitation to what we can actually use digital computers to solve problems. These hard problems are just going to be intractable. So the question we have to ask is, has our intuition of thinking about everything digitally and information digitally uh, wrong? Can we do better? Well, in fact, fortunately, there have been many, many brilliant minds who have been thinking about this exact problem. And dating even back to the middle of the 1970s, people starting, started to think about what is a more fundamental aspect of computational information. 
And that's when many theorists started to consider using the ideas of quantum mechanics to apply to information theory. And this all came around to an end in uh, around 1980, when there was actually a really famous uh, conference that was hosted by uh, MIT and IBM, in which uh, Richard Feynman uh, made this really, really famous quote that basically said, "Nature isn't classical, and if you want to make a simulation of nature, you have to make it quantum mechanical." And that's a really wonderful problem because it's not so easy. So his whole idea was that if you're going to try to simulate Nature, molecules, atoms, matter around us—it makes no sense to try to do that digitally. In fact, we need to make use of the fundamental things that are given to us by nature itself, which is quantum mechanics, and try to make a computational element out of that. And so, this this instance where where Richard Feynman made this proposal is, is often referred back to as when this concept of using quantum computers to Uh, for when, when quantum computers were first kind of envisioned. Now, of course, since then we've seen uh, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of work in terms of how we can actually build these and understand them. But I want to go into a little bit of detail to go tell you about exactly what it means uh, to build a quantum computer. Now, when we talk about information, we typically talk about bits, zeros, and ones. But the fundamental nature of a quantum bit, for for a quantum computer, is that it doesn't have to be just a zero or a one. It can actually be in a superposition of zero and one at the same time. But what's more interesting is that not only is it in the superposition state, but when you actually me measure it, you force it to choose either zero or one. There's a probability that at the end, when you actually look at your information. It will be zero or it will be one deterministically. So it's really this idea of superposition, combined with one other element, which is known as entanglement. Now, what entanglement says is that when you have particles that are entangled together, the fact that they're together means that they cannot be actually described independently of one another. It means that when they're collectively together, there is more information that's contained in the fact that they're correlated with one another than if they were simply to be separated apart. Now, all of this sounds probably pretty strange to you, and there's this, these, these fundamental concepts of superposition, uncertainty, and entanglement affect how information can be processed. So, rather than try to just think about how that all works, just Take it as a fundamentally different way of handling information, and by using that, using these rules, we can try to have a more efficient type of computer. And in fact, the way that a quantum algorithm actually works is to make use of these different rules. What you try to do is you try to make systems of superposition, superpositions of these quantum bits. These superpositions grow to be very, very large, basically two to the n. Then the idea is that you want to make interferences within this two to the n space, so that you actually get a computation at the very end, which is going to be more efficient than if you were to try to do it classically. To picture it a different way, with a traditional computer, we have typically n bits that come in, n bits that come out. And we ever only do operations on those n bits, but in a quantum computer, you still have n bits in, you still have n bits out, but through using superposition and entanglement, what we're going to do is we're going to blow up that middle space within the quantum computer to an exponentially large state of possibilities. N bits in, we grow up to two to the n space of exploration. Then, using entanglement, we're going to try to. Perform what's known as interference, and find paths that then lead to those end bits out that give us the solutions that we're looking for. And it's really by using this large space that is otherwise inaccessible with any type of digital computer that gives quantum computers its potential and its promise. Now, 
there's a number of classes of quantum computers that have been proposed, and we're, on the, we're, all, we're already heavily invested into working towards this, this progress. Uh, the holy grail of quantum computing is, is, is a system that's known as a universal fault-tolerant quantum computer. Now, uh, what this is, is it's a fully controllable, fully programmable quantum computer, uh, and there have been theoretically proven algorithms that can provide potentially exponential speed-ups. Now, you might have heard of some of these, these uh, potential algorithms. One of them is known as Shor's algorithm. It's a very famous one in that it's been discussed with regards to breaking an encryption. Essentially, it says that factoring, the problem which is behind much of modern-day encryption and is really, really difficult for, to perform on a, on a traditional computer, can in fact be done exponentially faster using a quantum computer. And so the thing is, though, that in order to actually have this work on a real quantum computer, it requires what's known as fault tolerance. To build in fault tolerance, you need what's known as error correction. And much like error correction classically and digitally, you need to have redundancy and additional resources. Well, to build this universal fault tolerant quantum computer, you actually need a lot more additional resources. And we're talking about needing something on the order of millions to tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of qubits before we get to the point of building these full-scale, universal, fault-tolerant quantum computers that can potentially break encryption. Now, that being said, we're still in a tremendously exciting time right now. In the past few years, we've been working on various simple toy demonstrations of a few qubits with a few number of operations. But now we're starting to reach this realm where we're, we can actually perform uh, a many number of operations on circuit widths of maybe a few order, uh, maybe a few hundreds of qubits. This next phase where we're embarking into, the entire community, is what we called approximate quantum computing. Others in the field also refer to it as noisy intermediate scale quantum computing. It's kind of a stepping stone on the way to this eventual fault-tolerant universal quantum computing realm. But in the meantime, today, what we're hoping to do is still make use of these systems with the complexities that I described, this kind of exponential scale-up into the two-to-the-end space, to still try and find uh, potential applications and potential use cases. See, the thing is, why is this region called noisy? It's because qubits fundamentally are very difficult to control. They have, they're susceptible to various heat, noise, and effects that can ruin the, the superposition states or make the entanglement go away. And so in the, in the near term, we basically need to uh, focus on how can we, even in the face of these types of errors and noise, still be able to operate and, and uh, try to do something useful. Now, it's within this space that now looking at the landscape of that hard and easy problem, we know that there's a space where classical computers are always going to be good at for certain problems. And then we now know also that there's going to be some realm where quantum computers can traverse into this space of really, really difficult problems. And the areas that, and application areas that we're looking at are, are in optimization, things like the logistics problems that I described before, Chemistry, so understanding things like molecular structure for eventually application to things like drug design or novel materials. And then machine learning. Are there ways to actually use this kind of exponentially large space of exploration to boost up things like support vector machines or various types of feature maps for, for machine learning? And so this is really the landscape of the fundamental background of quantum computing. But I also want to tell you a little bit that this is actually real. We are really building these systems. And throughout the world, there are many different types of quantum computing technologies that range uh, in things like ions, so atomic systems, you look at using the, the actual quantum mechanical energy levels of an of a, of a atomic system, to the quantum mechanical nature of photons and light. Things like nanowires and trapping electrons, uh, solid state defects, so looking at things like nitrogen vacancy centers, uh, trapping neutral atoms into little, uh, in, into little lattices. But at IBM, what we actually focus on is something which is more chip-based. 
we work on superconducting circuits, and it looks a little bit more like the processors that you have come to know and love in your phones and in your, in your, um, in your computers. Now, the thing with superconducting circuits uh, is that these are made out of a various, various materials that need to be cooled down to very low temperatures to actually work well. And I'll describe exactly what the system looks like for actually making these, these, uh, these processors work. But the main challenge, regardless of any of these quantum computing technologies, is to really solve a three-dimensional problem. There's, uh, there's three problems which we basically need to improve. Coherence, controllability, and connectivity. Coherence is essentially how long can the quantum mechanical system actually live? So I described these qubits earlier as being very noisy, and they can be, they can be uh, susceptible to all kinds of various things in the environment that makes the quantum mechanical effects go away. Coherence is a measure of how long does that does entanglement, the superposition, actually stay in our system. The thing is, in order to keep them very well isolated and have high coherence, it means that you might forego some controllability. And so therefore, you need to be able to balance how much coherence and how much controllability you have. Then beyond that, you want to be able to connect many of these qubits together. As in an actual processor, you want to scale this up and have a larger number of, of, of qubits. But yet that again, the actual act of connecting many of them can affect how, how well we can control them and how much co coherence we have. And so fortunately, with superconducting circuits at IBM, we've really been able to uh, work on all three of these dimensions and made a tremendous amount of progress to where we are today. Now, this is actually what one of our qubits look like. Uh, this is a zoom in of, of, of a superconducting qubit, which is based on a, a Josephson junction technology. So on the right, what you're looking at is a Josephson junction. This is a very small aluminum, oxi aluminum, aluminum oxide, aluminum junction that's defined using lithography, ele electron beam lithography. And now that is the small piece within the larger structure, the blue pads, which is actually just a capacitor. So the capacitors are made out of niobium. The, the junction, as I said, is aluminum. And so these are superconducting metals, but they're defined on silicon. So much like the, the, the various fabrication processes that we've come to know and love that we've used to develop our silicon technologies, we can use here again to develop these superconducting circuits. Now, scaling this up, what you can see on a larger chip is that we have, this is a chip with actually eight of these qubits. So those qubits are those rectangular boxes. And the squiggly lines that you're looking at are actually microwave resonators that connect the various qubits to one another and allow us to bring control signals to provide that controllability that I discussed. So, this is, in a nutshell, what one of these chips looks like. After we actually fabricate these, these, these processors, what we have to do is we have to package them, place them into a printed circuit board, much like you would have a motherboard in your, in your mainframes or in your PC. Except now this circuit board goes into a dilution refrigerator. And at the very bottom of this dilution refrigerator, which is sitting at a nice, a nice and cold 15 millikelvin, so very, very, very cold, uh, just a little bit above absolute zero. And it's within this refrigerator that you start to see that there's many different cooling stages all the way up towards uh, room temperature. So 15 millikelvin, 100 millikelvin, 900 millikelvin, 3 kelvin, 40 kelvin, and then room temperature. And all of these different stages basically provide a cooling infrastructure and control infrastructure so that we can accurately operate these superconducting qubit processors. And much like you would see inside of a mainframe, all these various electronics, we have different kinds of electronics and filters and, and uh, uh, in a hardware ecosystem inside of a refrigerator to make this type of system work. Now at room temperature, we also have a complementary classical traditional computing system. And all this is doing is generating signals that get sent down into the refrigerator to control the qubits. And these are typically uh, microwave frequency generators, microwave uh, pulse shapers that are used to, to basically program what we actually send into the qubit processor and then also read back what comes out of the qubit processor. 
when it's all when it's all closed up it looks like this and now you might see why I showed that first picture in my in my slide deck which is it starts to look a little bit like 1940s of traditional computing in terms of the amount of infrastructure that, that it takes the various types of bells and whistles that, it, that we require to control it now but we have been making a lot of progress with how well we can control these qubits the amount of time that the, the quantum state actually lasts has improved, has, is, has gone up a lot over the last 10 years, making this really a, becoming a viable technology. And uh, what started off back in uh, 1999 when the first superconducting qubit was observed uh, was, a was a coherence time of about 5 nanoseconds. And today now in our labs we're able to actually keep the quantum state in there alive for over 100 microseconds. Still doesn't sound very long, but it's been a tremendous amount of improvement in terms of how much we can do with these qubits. And, 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 and in terms of scalability, we've looked at various different types of uh, numbers of qubits, ranging from 2-qubit systems all the way up to 8-qubit and 16-qubit systems. And then more recently, we scaled this up even to another degree now with 20-qubit systems that are available for client access and prototype 50-qubit systems that are in the lab today which are now employing a different type of 3DI technology so that we can scale up even further beyond a planar geometry. Now, this is all probably pretty different to you in the sense that it feels like a physics experiment and something that uh, you would see in a university laboratory. But this is where things have changed, which is that through the cloud, we've now been able to make this a technology that's deployable and in fact usable by anyone and for anyone to learn. So in 2016, what we actually did was we launched the IBM Q experience. And it's the world's first cloud computing, cloud quantum computing platform. And it's for researchers, for educators, and for developers. And it's available for anyone to use and it's accessed via a simple online interface with uh, a, a web portal. Now, we've been really, really excited about the progress of our project. In fact, in, in uh, just a little over uh, a year and a half, we've seen over 70,000 people sign up to use our quantum experience. Uh, this includes over 1,500 different colleges and universities and institutions throughout the world. Who, and they've run over two, 2 million experiments on our devices. But perhaps what's, what's been most exciting is that this has generated 60 plus external research papers. Now, in terms of research, we've provided a tool that enables external people to actually test their theories, to run experiments on systems that otherwise were, in the past, were limited to physicists. Now, theorists are able to actually access them, access them over the cloud. And so the amount of research output that we've seen has been phenomenal. It's just been uh, a, a multiplication factor over which we can actually do by ourselves in a lab. But what we really see this as is an important step towards fostering and continuing to build this type of ecosystem of users in quantum computing. And uh, what we have is, in fact, various tools that are online for anyone to get started and to learn about. From the web browser, you can, you can easily start to learn how to program a quantum circuit. There's a very simple drag and drop user interface for uh, programming gates in, in the language of a quantum computer. It's, think of it as digital circuits in the, in, in the, in, in the old days of, uh, of your coursework. Now there's something equivalent to that, but how you would program a quantum computer. Now, we also have forums that are online that our researchers are always available to answer questions and to, to dis have discussions and inquiries. And we also have a developing open source community that I would describe a little bit more in, in the next few slides. But what, really, what we're really excited about is making this collaborative. We see quantum computing as something that's so exciting that it requires a lot of different, different uh, uh, fundamental uh, changes in how we work with it, right? It's very different from, uh, from, from working on a traditional type of just, just computing system. There's a lot to be learned. We need people to actually engage and be willing to open themselves up to a different way of thinking learning about things like entanglement, learning about things like superposition. And so we've also partnered up with uh, MIT through edX to offer up in, uh, a platform for education. And there's an entire course which is being taught at MIT, uh, edX, 
uh, which makes use and leverages the, the, the open tools that we have through our, our, our quantum experience platform. Now, it, perhaps what's also exciting is that our team is always going out these days doing outreach, going to things like CloudFest, going to events where we're actually holding hackathons, holding uh, coursework, uh, uh, coursework tutorials for various people who are looking to learn about it. And this is probably one of the most exciting parts that, that our teams be able to work on today. Now, just to get started, I advise you go to IBM.com slash IBMQ. From there, it leads you right to the experiment, experiment page where you can start to uh, sign in and access all of these different tools that we have available. Um, just to show you some of the details that we have online right now, we actually have a 5-qubit processor, uh, a 16-qubit processor that are completely open and available for anyone. Uh, now, these are physical devices that are inside real dilution refrigerators in our lab, completely connected via the IBM cloud. Um, we also have simulators. So if you want to see the performance of, say, what does a, uh, what does a, a real quantum processor look like compared with a perfect quantum processor, which is simulated at the moment, you can also do that. And so we have up to a 20 qubit simulator that's available, and, uh, uh, and we're constantly adding more and more features to uh, enable different types of experiments. Um, on this type of page, just to describe what you're looking at, you're looking at a bunch of different backends that we have and the various performance metrics and, dis and, and connectivity maps of what the actual processor looks like. And we provide this type of information because it's important for researchers to understand what, in fact, is, what in fact they're using. Now, uh, I do want to describe one other project that we're really, really excited about. And this is, this is what we call the uh, Quantum Information Software Kit, or KISS Kit. Uh, we launched this, we launched this uh, exactly a year ago. And uh, what it is is an open source community, uh, open source GitHub for uh, actually programming a quantum computer. So what's online and what's available through the quantum experience is a drag and drop type of interface. Think of it as a very assembly language type of thing. But to cater to a more developer crowd, we need to actually have layers of the software stack defined. And Qiskit is starting to try to do that. Basically, what we provide is an API that allows you to directly access the, the, the quantum devices, but also a software, Python-based software development kit so that you can use traditional tools like Jupyter notebooks and Python notebooks so that you can actually start to build in calls to a uh, quantum processor directly through just installing this, uh, this Qiskit uh, package. It's, it's so simple that really I encourage everyone to go and, and, and run the kind of the first quantum hello world uh, through our package. Um, we also provide a lot of documentation on our, uh, on, on our GitHub repository talking about how the actual device works, uh, describing tutorials in terms of understanding these very uh, traditional concepts of entanglement and, and superposition. Um, and like I said, you can go ahead right now and actually construct a program will, that will launch a call onto our quantum computer. This is a very simple uh, quantum program that makes a three qubit entangled state. And if you look at it, it looks very much like how you would program a regular computer, right? And so we're really excited about trying to do that, make the barrier much and much lower so that people can get started. Now. My last slide, my last few slides, what I want to discuss is that beyond this, where are we going with this, right? So we have this open source community. We're developing all these tools and fleshing out the software stack. But of course, what we care about is use cases. And so we're already starting to be able to look at certain things there. And we're really excited about, for example, looking at chemistry with a real quantum computer. So just last year, we were able to actually simulate uh, the, molecular, the molecular bond lengths of embarrassingly simple molecules. So hydrogen, lithium hydride, and beryllium hydride. They're small molecules for sure, but the point is we've now provided a framework that shows that there's this particular algorithm, which is called a variational quantum eigensolver algorithm, to explore this type of molecular structure on an actual quantum computer. And in fact, this exact, uh, this exact application, this exact um, 
use case, we have a Qiskit tutorial which walks you through exactly how you might actually simulate and run this type of lithium hydride experiment on a real quantum computer that's available online. Now, this result was we were really excited to have it published in Nature and represents really one of the near term areas that we're really excited about using quantum computers to address uh, real world type of, the type of problems, but also to develop a framework out towards, uh, towards making this, this, this near, near term schedule of, of being quantum ready, what we call. And so with that, I just want to thank you. I, want, I do want to encourage you to join our community. I think it's a, it's, this is the right time to get started. It's, unlike anything else that you've seen before. But via the power of the cloud, we can take something as difficult and as mind-blowing as quantum and place it in your hands. Thank you very much.